Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my tremendous honor to welcome you, our distinguished audience, and to collaborate with our expert panelists to, to co-chair this intriguing and exciting virtual roundtable panel on young entrepreneurs and investors closing the wealth gap. And this is on behalf of the prestigious Harassus Global Meeting 2022. And to any newcomers that are new to Harassus, I'm sure you're going to be very excited and stimulated by this discussion. But just to give you some insight, particularly to the Harassus community members who have loyally followed the interconnected manner in which we have constructed these discussions, this panel in particular evolved from our several global discussions on the greatest generational wealth transfer in history, which is about the substantial flow of private tra wealth transfer from, the forth from one generation to the forthcoming generation. We have the baby boomers and then, of course, the next generation inheritors. And there seemed to be a very much a lack of understanding of key trends that will play uh, a role going forward from this segment. Just in the USA alone, the wealth transfer is predicted to be 68 trillion between now and 2060, which is a monumental shift. And uh, it's actually greater in this, fra in this fragmented sector more than any one um, investment or, or asset category. However, in this panel discussion, we're going to go further than just the ultra high net worth and the next generation inheritors. What we aim to achieve in this discussion is to combine the perspectives of very diverse expert panelists who have a thorough knowledge of key catalytic forces that in combination will strongly embolden these future trends and prospective solutions. And of course, separately, our panelists represent expertise that will shape the future direction of entrepreneurship, investment, and how we may close this elusive wealth gap with key insights from sovereign wealth fund, pension fund, and the institutional investor world, the ultra high net worth family office next generation of impactors, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, and creatives, athlete influencers, entrepreneurs, impactors, and in combination with technology and engineering, and of course, the global ultra high net worth family office and family business entrepreneurial segments. So with look, such a plethora of expertise from representatives of these most su substantial and influential segments, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists. For, and firstly, uh, Naji Good, who is a Super Bowl champion and co-founder of VPO USA. Welcome, Naji. Hello. How are you doing, here? Honor and pleasure to have you. And uh, my good friend, David Herman, who is founder of Orchestrator Connections and New York City Ambassador for Nexus USA. Welcome, David. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Michael Madwell, who is also the president of the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute USA. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, everybody. And uh, we may be joined, uh, there may be a technical issue, but uh, Mikols Ramblis, who is the chief executive officer of Hush and the co-founder of WealthX USA. And of course, I'm Peter J. Arewin, who is the director of ADOS Holdings and ADOS Limited and the ADOS Group of Companies in the United Kingdom and of course globally. Well, look, really to kick things off and to give this sort of a, a sense of body and spirit and to understand where each of you are coming from, our audience would very much enjoy learning more about your background, areas of focus, and what led you to becoming interested and affiliated in young entrepreneurs, investors, and closing this wealth gap. So in about a minute, could you just summarize a bit of that for us, um, uh, Naji? Yes. Um, my background is exactly uh, where you stated from. I grew up um, in a football family in town in Cleveland, Ohio, um, not far from the birth, birthplace of football, um, where I studied. And naturally, um, for my dad, he's an engineer at Ford, studied to become an engineer all through high school, had a love and affinity for drawing and um, also sports. And in the time frame of me pursuing my NFL career and, and going to high school and going to college at West Virginia University, I was able to start a company um, with my partner, who's a really good friend of mine now, called VPO. Uh, VPO is a content optimization tool that makes any object in media interactive with mobile apps. And in doing so, um, developed a passion, um, just understanding my brand and my mind in engineering, 
um, develop the passion of creating the optimal process for all student athletes to own their own, own their own data, own their own name, image, and likeness. And in that process, was able to successfully create a business, partner with some of the owners of the NFL, and um, carry out what we're doing today. And um, as I pursued my career in the NFL, I did win a Super Bowl at the Philadelphia Eagles. So go Birds. Shout out to all of the Philadelphia Eagles fans that's not here today. And um, I played I play for 10 years. Um, and if anybody knows, the average career in the NFL is anywhere from two and a half to three years. So I was able to sustain a long career in the NFL, go through some ups and downs, kind of like compound interest, hit some, hit some ebbs, hit some flows, hit some um, valleys and peaks. And um, I was able to get to where I am today. So um, by virtue of meeting my partner and meeting David, I'm here today. And I just want to thank you all for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, Michael, again, a little bit about your background and what led you to becoming interested in and affiliated with young entrepreneurs, investors and closing the wealth gap. So uh, my background, uh, I got out of college and I immediately went to work at the State Pension Fund of California CalPERS, which is one of the biggest pension plans in the in the U.S., um, and then I ended up uh, at a company called Thompson Financial, which is a now it's Refinitive, but it's a huge uh, financial data or healthcare data company. And um, I went back for my master's degree at St. Mary's College, it's a little school out, out in the Bay Area, and uh, they started talking about sovereign wealth funds. I started seeing it in the news, and so we just built a website. <laughs> And from there, we uh, got a lot of traffic. It was a time where wealth funds were just getting their names out there. We created a uh, you know an organization to study these entities, and we created the first kind of transparency index, rating them um, on how transparent they were. Because a long time ago, um, there was fear on where they were going to invest their money. So, fast forward over a long period of time, back in you know two thousand eight till today. And um, we've created a uh, financial research uh, a business um, that both, you know, um, is, you know, meeting with institutional investors globally. But um, our main product line is a subscription service, giving our clients insights onto what investors are doing every day. So where they allocate money, um, you know, where they, uh, you know, want to spend capital. But how this ties entrepreneurship is, you know, as I've gone through this path, I've met an amazing amount of people along this journey who have, you know, come from various walks of life and have really helped enrich, you know, what I've done and, um, you know, share those experiences. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues is a former NFL and cornerback, and now he's uh, maybe cornerback, but uh, now he's a president of an asset management company. So it's really cool to see people from all different walks of life uh, being able to pivot and, you know, uh, you know, start new entrepreneurships and new careers. So, um, I'll try to contribute that to my dialogue here and then try to slide in some of the world of, uh, you know, global asset owners. Yeah. And, and that's important, uh, having your perspectives, because you're an entrepreneur yourself, but understand the interfacing the importance of how to do that with the institutional world. And that's where a gap a lot of intru- entrepreneurs miss. And David, of course, same question. Uh, I know you well, but there's a new audience that may not. Um, they should know who you are, because you're one of the preeminent figures in um uh, the next gen world and impact, but uh, a bit about your background and how you became interested in and affiliated with young entrepreneurs, investors, and closing this elusive wealth gap. Sure. Um, Happy to give new context and also say that, you know, it's very much an elusive wealth gap because the way society has been structured over the years is based on who you know, in terms of what upward mobility and prospects are. Um, I come from the arts and the world of philanthropy that led me into the world of, um, family offices and startups. And, you know, now I run my own business focused on impact and relationships. And a significant tenet of that comes from my upbringing. I grew up as, you know, a white kid in the South where a lot of my friends didn't look like me. We all played soccer together, not football, Najee. It wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was the type of thing where I was able, because of my family, to be able to get to New York. To quote, as my dad say, conquer New York make connections and make something of my life and build a successful career. And without the backbone of a strong family and the access they had, none of that would have been possible. So for me, when we talk about entrepreneurship and closing, closing the wealth gap, all of that upward mobility, future of work, it's all based on a societal push to show how the world should be represented equally, not just represented by those with the best access to have success. 
Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, and, and that, that's a huge, huge part of closing that wealth gap. But look, Najee, what are the investment criteria and differences you've come across as an entrepreneur between sort of private family office and maybe institutional investors that you encounter? Uh, and how can entrepreneurs more effectively align their interests with these categories of, of investor, in your opinion? Yeah, um, I can speak from personal experience and just really um, educating myself through understanding what a family office is and being an accredited investor and actually vetting opportunities that come across our way. Because um, as athletes, we we do, we make a huge spike in capital. Um, you know, our contracts are are cash heavy. Everybody wants to play, you know, professional sports. And once we are presented, you know, with the money that we have, um, just going about the process has been, you know, eye-opening for me when it comes to entrepreneurs and investing, because as an athlete, you're basically an entrepreneur. You go and you, you, you go through this learning curve, this learning process while you're in college. Um, for basketball, it's even shorter. Um, for David and soccer, those guys go right out of high school. But um, as they're presented with opportunities to invest, um, me specifically, I got the opportunity to go to New York. I was able to sit down um, with my partner and look at different um, categories or I would look, look at different attributes of investing um, in terms of what type of business you want to invest in, what type of returns you want. Um, and in doing so and playing sports is one of the very few occupations that you can do that has a return that it has. Um, we say that, you know, for every season that you make it, it's like hitting the lottery. Um, it's a little bit different when you look at business deals, whether you're trying to jump into a VC, jump into a hedge fund or, or enter a family office and understand the, the, the rate of return. And um, since I am younger in this aspect of my life and doing so, I've been able to just bet deals through really through my network and understand that um, as I grow and build my business, um, I look at the different attributes of what can make my business su successful, um, looking at different things as far as overhead rate of return, looking at the involvement. And the one thing that has always been true to me about um, investing and becoming an, an investor in a business is you invest in people, you invest in uh, not ideas. And um, that was really huge to me because um, there's a lot of players that are current and active in the NFL. And when they actually speak about investing and they speak about um, bridging the wealth gap to understand that they are usually the first person in their family um, to, do, to accomplish such a, a heavy goal of making as much money as they're making. Mm. Um, to vet that process and to, you know, to, to understand that, you know, your profession is, a, your profession is in one sport. You need to, you know, align yourself with like-minded individuals like you're on this call to understand, um, you know, investing in the future. Uh, that's been really my goal. It's, it's been to align myself with individuals like David. It's been um, my goal to align myself with individuals like Jonathan, my partner, to understand um, the process of what successful entrepreneurs have been able to invest and um, to do it properly, do it the right way. Because uh, right now in our generation, there's things like NFTs, there's cryptocurrency, there's all types of things that's being thrown out to us. But um, personally speaking, you have to read. You got to force yourself to read. You got to force yourself to engage and understand um, what the process is. And me personally, I'm good with numbers. Uh, so I have to force myself to read it two or three times over again so that the engineering side of me uh, calms down and the listening and the, uh, the literature side of me picks up. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. But um, as I continue to grow, I definitely look to understand more aspects of investing in entrepreneurship. Yeah, indeed. And, and uh, it's interesting how you've got that perspective of an athlete. And of course, we see it with a lot of uh, family offices that have a liquidity event or an athlete, et cetera. And the same dedication, that commitment that may you, you had as an athlete to become successful, you've now got to apply that to be in an investor to grow, protect and grow that fortune to something even greater. Uh, Michael, as well, uh, same question, of course. I mean, what are the differences between private um, family office and particularly your area of knowledge, which is institutional investors globally? And how can entrepreneurs more effectively align their interests with these different um, categories of investor. Michael? Uh, first, I want to echo Najee's comments. I absolutely agree that people is the secret sauce of a successful company. And a lot of, uh, you know, venture capitalists, uh, which get their money from foundations, endowments, sovereign funds, and pension plans, uh, that's an important part. Um, you know, who are the people involved in the company? What's their track record? You know, can they achieve this level of success? And so, um, you know, layering this cake uh, I think that, um, yes, sovereign funds, pension plans, they historically invest through funds to identify these, you know, uh, 
various companies, whether it's, you know, Uber or all these firms that have, you know, been able to IPO and enter the public markets. Now, um, how can we expand that? Well, what's happening on the asset owner side of the table is that a lot of them want to go direct. They want to disintermediate venture capital funds and participate in more co-investments. So they are looking for emerging companies in this very space. And what they're doing is they're hiring more internal staff. They're increasing the capability. They're going to more conferences, networking events, joining more associations and trying to understand, you know, where is the future? I mean, where are the future companies going to be coming from? So right now, what we've seen through our research is that a lot of um, the growth has been in technology, data, um, you know, some, you know, you know, uh, you know, threads of healthcare, but basically data, you know, how can we identify these, these companies and where are we getting all this information from? So um, now how can entrepreneurs access sovereign wealth fund, you know, pension endowment capital? First off, there are all different types of investors. Some will only allocate to managers. So there's still the aspect of an entrepreneur getting to know the venture capital community and building those inroads there. Um, but the larger sophisticated sovereign wealth funds, um, you know, it's really just putting yourself out there, getting your name out there, being able to communicate what you're trying to do to a wide range of people. And so um, I think just, uh, uh, you know, networking is probably the biggest thing one can do. But I know entrepreneurs are always stuck, right? They're always trying to build their product. They don't want to spend much time on the road marketing their, uh, you know, you know, raising capital. So it's that, you know, you know, push and pull. But overall, there are opportunities growing every day. And um, interestingly, you know, companies need to even run, uh, raise less money because of technology. I mean, back you know, in, in the 2000s, you needed a lot more money to raise to start a venture. Right now, with all the software and the, and the stack of available te technologies, you can start a business relatively quickly. And that has increased and increased wealth on the world. Um, it's increased wealth in other countries that they've been able to grow their entrepreneurial e uh, ecosystems. And that's also being pushed by the various governments in those countries. So, you know, good examples would be the United Arab Emirates and Dubai, Abu Dhabi. They have, um, you know, uh, sort of government backed or sovereign wealth fund backed incubators um, that will reach out and try to foster entrepreneurship in that country. So if you're an entrepreneur in America and you're looking to possibly raise some money, you know, maybe you might want to move, you know, relocate to Dubai um, where it's an international city and you might get, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, different markets and, you know, you know, different ways of, um, you know, raising capital. So I'll go into more detail on, you know, like, you know, um, you know uh, in this talk, but I just want to, there is more opportunity now than I think ever before. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And there's also the understanding of a global mindset as opposed to a, a local or, or even a regional mindset. And now, we're, of course, we're in the, the era. I've become a global citizen the old fashioned way by living in countries. But now, particularly with COVID, it created this phenomenon of the, uh, the, uh, the global digital global citizen now. And so you can literally be in, in one place, but transacting or working and, and, and growing business globally. Yeah, David, uh, same question, of course. I mean, what are the investment criteria and differences you've come across you know, in private, family office, and even institutional level of investors globally? And how do you feel entrepreneurs can more effectively align their interests with these different categories of investor? Sure. Um, I think to pick up from what Michael and Najee said to start, there's really three elements entrepreneurs need to succeed besides a great idea and the time to do it. Um, the first is a real mentor. A mentor that doesn't want something from them, that wants something with them. Yes. And finding the right people to trust with that is absolutely key. And especially for those entrepreneurs who have success or perceived success, there's a lot of sharks, wolves, whatever animal that eats others we could think of. And that's not the that what you want. And the other part of that, and this is the advice a lot of mentors give to entrepreneurs, is be very careful who your first investors are. You know, the same way that I spoke in another panel recently, Peter, about activist philanthropists, there are really some incredible activist investors, people who will not step into a company early stage unless their expertise, their advice, their strategy that they roll up and they provide as a service, sometimes a service for extra equity is accepted. And that's because a lot of my friends who run venture capital funds or just family offices with big portfolios, they 
they are remiss that they do not speak to the CEOs of each company every day. There's a difference now of a passive investor and those that are active. And so when one is engaging as an entrepreneur with the family office, with the venture fund, with the wealth fund, whatever it might be, understanding the parameters by which there's an engagement beyond the check and the contract is absolutely key. But the component of this that really builds that trust, the final of these three, besides mentorship and really an activist strategic investor, is community. And when you talk about, Peter, global citizens, there are global communities for every niche of every type of entrepreneurship now in ways that are were unfathomable even five years ago. If you are an immigrant in the United States focused in fintech, there is a community for you. If you are a women investor from the MENA region, there are private communities. So this type of uh, access is now very much community driven and being around peers that used to be involved, used to be viewed as competition, now is viewed as a backbone to success. No, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and you're, a, a, of course, a leader of a very trusted, high integrity community. I was involved in, 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 in these communities as well way back before. Now, now everyone's building a software platform to bring these communities together. But when it was just your own private contact book and wealthy families only dealt with other wealthy families, it's, it's really evolved. But it's very interesting when you get a lot of former private bankers or asset managers, they want to hover into the family office world put a, a label on the door and uh, they've got great technical expertise second to none but they just don't have that uh, interface or human touch or knowledge of how the, the private investor or the family thinks and you sometimes also get the private investor that wants to interface institutionally and they just don't quite understand and have that meeting of the minds and that's obviously a big issue that many um, uh, entrepreneurial and investment ventures um, have to grapple with Getting on to our next question, and, uh, and this one is really custom made for you, I think, Naji. I mean, how can we offer the opportunity to a new generation of entrepreneurs and investors to start building up wealth and increase social mobility while working on closing that wealth gap? Um, I think a natural fit, that is a question for me. I think a natural fit as a young entrepreneur um, is the, I would say, um, a little bit of both needing to change to stay the same. Um, what we've done, I can just kind of speak with personal experience. What we've done has been so out of the box and so extraordinary with my teammates and um, with my partners that I believe that um, by virtue of just naturally things that's happening with digital media, social media, um, there's a lot of different ways to receive information now. And really what entrepreneurs, younger entrepreneurs need to do is understand in which way the old guard or in which way the, um, the BCs, the hedge funds, are looking to invest institutionally, like as an institution or as a new idea, new idea, i.e. what we're doing with VPO. We've taken a, um, you know, a, I would say a different approach to how we built our company. And in the process, I've been able to learn about a, various different styles of how to become a different entrepreneur or how to become an accredited investor, like I said before. But uh, really when it comes down to understanding what the institutional investors will like to see, um, it's been it has been, you know, kind of a sink or swim type of deal as to where you attend these family offices events like um, what David has brought us to before in the past or speaking at engagements like this. And you have to be able to download the information. And as a younger individual, um, I would speak to something that's just uh, kind of going around common today in the world with this, uh, you know, you need to pay attention and you need to actually find your niche, find what's good for you, find what uh, can keep and engage your attention as a young entrepreneur, um, because I, I like to draw. I have a, a background in art as well and drawing. And um, when I first started um, and joined our company, I joined for the artistic creative side. And as I got to dive into the technological side and, and the actual, um, the things that make our company tick and um, why, why we did the things that we did and learned about the market and the exchange, um, those things start to pick up with my interest naturally of, um, you know, understanding the market, understanding, you know, New York is fascinating to me. I don't know if anybody else listening to understand the stock market, understand the global trade system, um, going public in Europe versus going public in New York or going public in Singapore. And as I got to see those different things um, naturally through my own lens, um, you know, I had a particular way I needed to organize them. And um, I've read and looked at certain books from, you know, other wealthy investors and saw how they look and vet deals, look at different screens to understand what's going on with 
the, a VC or how someone likes to invest. And um, the thing that I've been able to pick up on is that there's a certain set of constructs that the way the world used to move. And now with social media, digital media and cryptocurrency, there is a new wave that's coming in. Um, I think that if anything, now as being a younger entrepreneur, you have a big opportunity to grab both the old and the new. And, um, you know, while I'm doing so, I'm trying to make sure that I maintain focus. But uh, the best thing that I can do is, is that I stay true to what I love and I stay true to what I like um, as far as learning and how do, I, how do I integrate that into learning about how to become a better entrepreneur and how to be a more successful entrepreneur. So as we go about and learn different things, I think that the niche of um, digital media, actually technology is going to evolve so that entrepreneurs can stay more engaged, so that young entrepreneurs can learn faster and then they can educate themselves to become um, you know, better, better entrepreneurs, younger entrepreneurs and accredited investors. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Naji. And uh, Michael, same question. Um, how can we offer the opportunity to this new generation of entrepreneurs and investors to start building up wealth and increase social mobility while working on closing that wealth gap? Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it's kind of already happening right now. Like Naji was saying, we we're saying is that, you know, there is, I mean, we have the internet. I mean, all bits of information is out on there. So, if you're looking for capital and if you're looking for investors, you just hit up the search and you can find it. And so that's kind of leveled the playing field. And in addition, all the different technologies that are available. I mean, you can take one example like Squarespace. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not endorsing that product at all, but I'm saying like uh, website services like that are helping people who have never had a website, just getting a website on the internet and being able to access these things is huge. Um, I think, to, you know, closing the wealth a gap in, in in terms of I'm going to focus more on the emerging markets and you know uh, you know countries. Uh, I think access to uh, being able to uh, trade and you know raise money on you know mobile apps, especially like, like in Africa or in parts of you know Asia. I think that would be really helpful. Is if more of this technology was built so that people can trade their goods and not worry about. Um, you know, uh, you know, banking, because a lot of the world's still underbanked. And so I think those kinds of technologies are very transformative. It's like everyone, every uh, person, every boomer always talks about that uh, African person wearing that outfit with the cell phone. It's like, I got more power on my phone than today than NASA did in 1960. I hear it all the time on every TED talk. But uh, that's kind of what's happening is, 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 is basically technology and basically getting a, a payment system in place for many of these emerging markets where they can conduct trade. And because not everyone's going to get venture capital. I mean, our company didn't get venture capital. It's not always going to be a thing. So, uh, cause venture capitals tend to kind of, you know, want to look at the hottest thing, you know, if they're going to all choose the same sector and pile money into the next app or, you know, whatnot. So most entrepreneurs will not raise venture capital, will probably raise some sort of, some form of debt. And so that's why um, creating um, either, you know, new types of banks, new, you know, new types of lending institutions. And I think a lot of these countries are going in that path going forward. Also the whole payment apps, which I talked about earlier. So access to money, access to, you know, get your business going so that you can start uh, growing, hiring people, et cetera. That's the most important part for most entrepreneurs, like the whole venture capital that's serving still a very small segment of people. Most of it, it's actually going to be debt and lending, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And then there's also the good side of venture capital and the dark side. Like dark side, some very savvy even entrepreneurs have said they've had to reject offers because I remember one in particular, they wanted over 10% just to raise the money. So the venture capitalists were more like a merchant of money. And then they also wanted a majority of the equity in the company. And of course, they had to reject it. So whereas the family office or the private investor or the angel will think a lot differently uh, and they can also park their money and leave it there usually for longer periods of time. Whereas the, the manager or the venture capitalist is thinking of that three to five year exit. So one is more of a partner, um, long term capital. Another is, of course, is thinking as a short term solution. David, again, same question. Um, how can we offer the opportunity to a new generation of entrepreneurs and investors to start building up wealth and increase that uh, social mobility while working on closing that wealth gap? So it's, I have this very blatant, honest answer for that, which is invite those people to the table. Stop trying to cater and, you know, 
look at, say, entrepreneurs of color or entrepreneurs from, you know, second or third world countries as having solutions that just work for themselves. They might have incredible solutions that work for the world. And when you look at it through a lens of we need to have a couple more black women founders because they're underrepresented, you're doing a disservice to their innovation because their innovation isn't only for their community. When we try to course correct with putting wealth in whatever way it comes to close a wealth gap because we think it should be closed for the sake of humanity, we miss the point. Take any incredible innovation in the last 50 years and show me which ones were created by white men who lived in those countries for three centuries. Because I don't see it. The majority of innovation on this planet comes from immigrants. It comes from people now of mixed race. It, it's something that is just unfathomable to me, the number of innovations that come from women and yet they do not get the access. And for me, it's a blindness. It's the same way that people say that you know, we go with what we're comfortable with. I think we should be uncomfortable not putting people in front of each other that literally should be in front of each other because the only thing that's the differentiator is they weren't invited to the table. Amen. When I do panels, you know, yeah. Thank you, Peter. I mean, that for me is the way to do it. At my event series, my private community, there's never been a single event in front of my massive crowd of influential connectors where two white men speak. That for me would be a sin for being somebody who was affirmative and focused on women and people of color and immigrants and the rest to say, hey, the best two things in the room happen to be people that look like me. Let's put them up in front of a crowd. It's a conscious effort that needs to be made. There's system, there's processes, and people are afraid. They are afraid to course correct because it's something they don't know. And when we're not comfortable, we feel like we should stick with, within our comfort zone. And for me, the discomfort should be that we still do so. And most people that have changed the world for the better have had to go against the grain, against the establishment, and out particularly of that comfort zone. That is the whole of many, many entrepreneurs. Um, and that's one thing I think even the family office world is underestimated when these next gens are trying to find their feet. The myth is that they're all given huge amounts of money to go and, and fail and then they're all, all going to be secure. I know many of them that have created it completely separately from the family. Um, and they've mm -hmm. been hugely empowering to, the, uh, to other entrepreneurs um, as well. Look, um, okay, now for the next part, can we keep the answers really short and sharp, sort of 45 seconds to a minute, so that way we can give as much content before a close. So, Naji, look, uh, and I know you know the digitization side well, from your own perspective and interests, as the trajectory of economies continues to be digitally transformed, globalized, and regulated, what do you feel is most ap the appropriate direction forward for the next generation to take when it comes to social impact, financial stability, and wealth distribution? Naji, in about a minute. Um, what you said, what is the most important? Yeah. Yeah. That will lead to yeah. social impact, financial stability and greater wealth distribution. Yeah. I think the, um, I think that the most important thing to that is actually having, um, one is the truth Two is the, the accurate data to back. Um, because there's so many ways that we collect data. Now, um, we talk about social impact, we talk about the reach of different entrepreneurs and, um, you know, the actual understanding of the world and what 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 goals different social initiatives are trying to accomplish. I think that um, having something that makes data reliable and having something that makes the actual uh, entrepreneur understand in a, in a form or facet that they're not with, they're not used to. Um, me, like I said before, using my own answers or using my own situations, I was able to learn and um, kind of sink or swim. And the best part about it was you, you sift through a lot of um, you know. BS, like a better word, to figure out what's uh, what's real and whatnot. And I think that as a young entrepreneur, we're, we're we're overloaded with so much information that we need to know what's real. And those those impacts and those initiatives, or those initiatives that are making true social impact, um, those you know that we need to figure out the truth about them. We need to understand the truth about what's going on with those things. And that takes a little bit more deep dive from the entrepreneur so that they can actually understand what's going on in the world. So um, the step from the entrepreneurial side is I think the biggest thing that needs to happen in figuring out what initiatives that they want to align with, what um, information that they can find to be truthful and more inspirational to them so that they can make a real change and they can make real impact. 
Yeah, thank you. And and David saying question as the trajectory of economies continues to become digitally transformed, globalized and regulated. What do you think is the most appropriate direction forward the next generation should take when it comes to social impact, uh, financial stability and greater wealth distribution? I think that one should have an intolerance of companies who do not embrace social values when they are founded. Mm -hmm. Short That's and sweet. Simple. Short and sweet. And again, short and sweet from you, Michael. Same question. Michael, you um, I think uh, basically uh, our, the U.S. education system should emphasize teaching as a parent uh, children about money how to save money, how to invest. And I think a lot of people are just lost in it. So that's the first thing that uh, should happen before anything else, I'm, in my personal opinion. And I've got another one for you that I think is custom made, uh, Michael, because what do you feel governments, institutions, entrepreneurs, and asset managers need to do to either capture your attention or that of private investors, family offices, and institutional investors when they're presenting a profit, a for-profit or a social impact investment uh, to, the, to you or these third parties? Okay, so if you're a, a, like a social impact company or trying to raise money from a sovereign or a large you know, public asset owner that does those kinds of activities is basically, uh, if I was an entrepreneur in, in that aspect, figure out what they want, learn more about them. So you know, don't go to a random sovereign wealth fund that does not invest in, in you know, venture capital and try to pitch a venture capital investment. So understanding what the investor and what they currently invest into is the number one most important thing, keeping very short. Sure. And and David, this one is, is for you. I mean, are there any misconceptions, trends, or key points that you feel are important to share with our audience that they may not be aware of about young entrepreneurs, investors, and closing the wealth gap in USA or globally? Um, misperceptions, especially alluding to your earlier question to Michael about governments and institutions and the rest. Um, the misperception is that the bureaucratic way that access to this capital has been created is actually easy. And if people just know how to apply or know where to find it, that it's actually there. Some of these things are monumentally challenging because they're not created with entrepreneurs in mind. I would simply say the solution is have entrepreneurs create the best ways for that access to capital to flow because currently that system does not, is not intuitive on a global scale. Yeah. And this one for Najee, I'll, I'll, I think this is a great one for you. I mean, what are some key lessons you've learned from your experience or even from observations that you feel has brought positive collaboration and change to the entrepreneur business or ventures with which you've participated, advised on or observed? Um, I think the key thing that I've learned is to um, take your own experiences and to incorporate them in what you do. Um, be yourself. Um, I've learned that a great lesson from David and, and, and from my partners as well. And understanding that, um, like I go back to the same ideas that people invest, you know, institutions, they invest in people, um, understanding who you are, your personal experience. And as a young entrepreneur, you bring a different perspective that an investor or, or a longtime successful businessman might not have had, and they might understand how to capitalize on that. So as I've been able to learn more, um, my partner, Jonathan, always say, be, be the teacher and the student. So um, and understanding that perspective, learning as well as teaching yourself how to do certain things. Um, I take that approach every single day. And I think that other young entrepreneurs should do that same thing. Uh, amen to that as well. Yeah, the power of a mentor that is an expert in some area is extraordinary and adds greater depth to you. In some cases, you may be dealing with billionaires, but you could be their mentor in, in a certain area that you have expertise. And that's where I think some entrepreneurs sell themselves short uh, as their perception of themselves as little me in a big world. When if you've focused on something, they say the 10,000 hour rule, if you're focused on something for 10,000 hours or more, you usually are a master of it. So remember that audience. Look, now we're just going to do short and sharp answers. 30 seconds, guys, that's maximum. So I'll start with you, uh, Michael. In 30 seconds is a gift and insight just for our audience here at Harassus. If you had to pick one or maximum two insights you feel are most important about young entrepreneurs, investors and in closing the wealth gap, what would that be? Um, I would focus actually on, I agree with everyone here, getting a mentor is huge. That, so that's just be my one is getting a mentor to show you the ropes, show you how things work, um, being able to test ideas back and forth, 
that's everything. So mentorship is very important. Yeah, I'd agree. But a mentor that's been there and done that and experienced what you have, amen to that. And David, uh, same question. As a gift and insight, what are, as one or maximum two insights you feel is most important about young entrepreneurs and investors closing the wealth gap, what would that be? So from either entrepreneur or investor side, if you're in it for the long haul, then build relationships for the long haul. Don't build them for the next step you have to climb. Yeah, unequivocally agree without question. And Najee, same question. One, maximum two insights you feel are most important about young entrepreneurs, investors, and closing the wealth gap. What would that be? Um, I would say that um, when you fail is a learning experience as well as the absence of failure is a success um, in, in some aspect or another. So um, as you continue to work and build and you learn, um, when you do fail on one aspect um, and you're able to continue to grow, then that was a huge learning success. And when there isn't failure in what you're trying to accomplish, then you can take that as a success and keep learning as well. Absolutely. And often you learn more in failure or challenge than actual success. Um, like the, the, the famous quote from Rocky Balboa, it's not about how many times you go down, it's how many times you get up and keep moving forward. And yes. finally, of course, if you had to pick one investment or entrepreneurial opportunity anywhere in the world, in any sector, you feel would be most profitable or socially impactful as a hot tip for our, our people here to pay attention to, what would that be and why? Michael? Uh, since I'm kind of in the sovereign wealth and large asset owner world, go where there's fear. And so um, wealth funds are long-term holders of wealth. Be contrarian. So right now, probably, you know, some sort of undervalued stock. <laughs> Okay. And David, same question. If you had to pick one investment or entrepreneurial opportunity, it can be anywhere in the world, any sector, which you feel will be the most profitable and or socially impactful. What do you feel that would be and why, David? There is a uh, social good business that a friend of mine runs called Atma, A-T-M-A. It is a global network of change makers similar to Ashoka meant to have local communities empower each other. If you create the rise of the rest or the meek that will inherit the earth, which they will, then you actually create true social change from the bottom up. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, if, and with those high level communities where you're uh, practicing the three C's of collaboration, co-creation, and more importantly, and this is what a lot of people don't, they think the last one is competition. It's actually co-elevation of one another, where you're empowering one another to climb to another level. I think if, if, if entrepreneurs can form a private community of, 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 of mentors and like-minded people, it makes all the difference. And Naji, I'll let you take us home on that last one. If you had to pick one investment, uh, other than VPO, of course, which will change the world, but <laughs> one investment or entrepreneurial opportunity anywhere in the world in any sector you feel will be profitable or socially impactful, what would that hot tip be and why? Um. Just like I said, being very young and, and, and um, understanding the you know, investment entrepreneurial world, I would say it's something that would have to deal with um, similar to what Michael said, but also um, sustainability and clean energy. I had the privilege to be, to be a part of the Nexus group uh, through the network here. And um, clean energy and sustainability is something that um, is a very huge, huge opportunity um, as we heal the earth and as we continue to grow. Um, we need a planet to live on. So I would think that uh, the investing into sustainability, clean energy, and actually taking care of the ground that we walk on for those individuals that are minorities, women, and, um, you know, white men as well, to be able to provide platforms um, to successfully be able to build businesses, um, I think is going to be a huge sector. And also got to throw in VPO. So. <laughs> Of course, of course. But again, if, if we don't f focus on some of uh, these aspects of sustainability now, there won't, may not be any wealth to transfer or what will the world look like uh, in a world without the proper sustainability measures. Look, this has been a, such an exciting discussion. We could have taken this on for, for hours and hours and hours. Uh, but in summary, just for our audience to tie this up, we've gained some unique insights and perspectives on young entrepreneurs and investors on closing the wealth gap from our expert panelists all of which you know, possess such a diverse and dynamic backgrounds, which has given us such a plethora of different perspectives now. Um, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to go out to my business uh, and to look at uh, and, and, and look at applying a lot of what I've learned today. 
Um, what we've covered, of course, are their perspectives on what the investment criteria and differences are between different institutions, different investor categories globally, and how entrepreneurs can more effectively align interests. We've also looked at how we can offer the opportunity to a new generation of entrepreneurs uh, and investors to start building wealth and increase social mobility on closing that wealth cap. We've looked at digitization, globalization and regulation and how appropriate direction forward on impact, financial stability and wealth uh, distribution can go. Also, governments, institutions, entrepreneurs and asset managers and what you need to do to capture their attention. And of course, um, my favorite part of the discussion, that one special takeaway insight from each panelist. Look, we strongly encourage all of our distinguished audience to take action with the tremendous knowledge and insight provided today and welcome interaction and collaborations, which is what's made Harassus such a successful community over the years. Therefore, for any thoughts or questions, you're welcome to reach out to Harassus directly, myself via email at inquiries, that's with an E, at ATOS Investments, that's A-E-T-O-S Investments.com, or via LinkedIn at Peter J.R. Aylwin, that's A-Y-L-W-I-N, or adosinvestments.com, or of course, our distinguished expert panelists via their social media and details provided in their bios. This concludes our Young Entrepreneurs and Investors Closing the Wealth Gap Virtual Roundtable discussion. I'd really like to thank our expert panelists for their valuable contributions, the committed staff of Harassus, and particularly Harassus Chairman, Frank Jürgen Richter, for his dedication and commitment, which has made this engaging virtual roundtable possible. Ladies, gentlemen, and our distinguished guests, I wish you an absolute abundance of prosperity, unlimited success going forward, and of course, a most enjoyable rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take Thank care. you, Peter.